Zacharias and the Trail of the Templars by Glenn and Chase Kimball. Executive producer, John Fassett. Produced and narrated by David Allen. The book of Zechariah in the Old Testament was speaking of a prophet during the reign of Darius the Great, king of Persia. He was the successor of King Cyrus, who helped the Jews return from their Babylonian captivity in the 6th century B.C. He was not Zacharias of the New Testament, who was the father of John the Baptist. The New Testament Zacharias was simply not the same man. Who was Zacharias? Many have suggested that the Zacharias of the New Testament was a descendant of the Zechariah of the Old Testament. However, Zechariah of the Old Testament was from the tribe of Joseph, while most believe that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were both from the tribe of Aaron, or Levites. Because Zacharias was a Levite, his lineage gave him the rights to work in the temple more than the other members of other tribes. By the time of Zacharias, most of the tribe of Levi had been taken north with the ten lost tribes of Israel after the reign of Jeroboam. The two main tribes who inherited land near Jerusalem were Judah and Benjamin. That is complicated by the fact that Elizabeth was a cousin of the Virgin Mary, who was from the tribe of Judah. In fact, Elizabeth was named after one of the daughters of Aaron. Perhaps all of the above are true, given the fact that None of the tribes were pure descendants from any single family of Israel. There were no requirements to marry someone from your own tribe, though it was highly recommended that you marry someone within the general house of Israel. It is believed that there were as many as 20,000 priests in or around Jerusalem at the time of John the Baptist. There is a difference between being a priest from one of the 11 tribes of Israel and a high priest from the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi had the special calling to be officiators in the temple. The Levites were intermingled into all the tribes of Israel so that they would all have someone who could carry on the rites of the sacred temple. To be a high priest was a conspicuous responsibility and made him a prominent personality in the land. It was the custom of the high priests, because they were prominent figures, to keep their responsibilities with great care. Zacharias was of the course of Abia, see 1 Chronicles 24, verse 10, though he was also a Levite. During David's time, all of the priests were divided into 24 courses or groups to better organize the administration of religious rites. These groups were named after the sons of Eleazar and Ithamar, who were the sons of Aaron. Abijah, or Abia, was the eighth of 24 courses or families for serving at the altar. Each of these 24 groups would take their turn administering in the temple. Abia was called the father of the sea, or seamen. These were traditionally merchants who made their money from trade, which is likely the source of the wealth of Zacharias and his cousin Joachim, the father of the Virgin Mary. Exploration has revealed the fact that the whole region near the eastern end of the Mediterranean was known as the West. Abia was the son of Rehoboam, who in turn was the son of King Solomon. Abia became the father of the West, not to be confused with Jeroboam, the king of the lost tribes of Israel, who had many of the Levites in their midst. This is a strange name to give a son who expected to inherit the kingdom of Solomon and David. However, Abia became the father of those who were captured and taken west, namely the ten lost tribes. Among them was most of the tribe of Levi. Jerusalem was left with just a remnant of Levites in their midst. The net effect of the capture of the ten tribes was to make the name Abia a burlesque, and one does not wonder why it was changed to Abijah, which means, My father is Yahweh. The 24 classes of priests were urged to serve a week at a time in sequence. During the Jewish captivity in Babylon, most of these courses or groups of priests lost their identity. Only four of these courses remained intact enough 
that they were recognized when they returned from Babylon. But these four were divided again into 24 using the old original names in order to keep them organized. It is clear that Zacharias was both appointed as a temporary priest in charge of the burning of incense and as a high priest in charge of the temple itself. The offering of incense was one of the most solemn parts of the daily worship, and owing to the large number of eligible priests, most priests could not hope to perform the task for a week more than once during his lifetime. However, it appears from the fact that Zacharias was serving in the temple at the time of the conception of both Mary and Elizabeth, and also when John the Baptist was born, and he took care of the Virgin Mary in the temple while she was growing up, that Zacharias had other responsibilities that caused him to linger in the temple for a much longer period of time. Zacharias was still serving when he was struck dumb as he doubted the annunciation of the conception of John the Baptist. And when he came out into the public to give the customary prayer or blessing, he could not do so. Therefore, He was not just one of the sequenced temple workers who spent one week in their whole life working in the temple, but a constant officiator as well. This was because he was from the tribe of Levi, whose specific blessing it was to officiate in the temple. To be a high priest and married to a high priest's daughter was a double distinction. A.T. Robertson adds that it was like a preacher married to a preacher's daughter. This made him even more unique and could have been an additional reason he spent so much time in the temple. Both the Proto-Evangelium written by James and even the Islamic Quran tell the story that Mary was occasionally fed by the angels when Zacharias came to give her food. The Quran states, Remember when a woman of Imran said, My Lord, I have vowed to thee what is in my womb to be dedicated to thy service. So do thou accept it of me. Verily, thou alone art all hearing, all knowing. But when she was delivered of it, she said, My Lord, I am delivered of a female. And Allah knew best of what she was delivered. And the male she desired to have was not like the female she was delivered of. And I have named her Mary, and I commit her and her offspring to thy protection from Satan the rejected. So her Lord accepted her with gracious acceptance and caused her to grow an excellent growth and made Zacharias her guardian. Whenever Zacharias visited her in the chamber, he found with her provisions. He said, O Mary, whence hast thou this? She replied, It is from Allah. Surely Allah gives to whomsoever he pleases without measure. The Quran clearly states that Zacharias was considered a prophet among Islam and was the guardian of the Virgin Mary, but adds that Mary was also called the mother of Esau rather than using the name Jesus. It was a long-held custom that the gods of Egypt included the story of Isis, Osiris, and Horus. This story is a mimic of the real story of Jesus and was probably a prophecy of things to come. The priestesses of Isis looked forward to the coming of this man-god. Looking farther to the east, the writings of the Buddha Isa are the writings of Jesus held sacred today by groups like that of the Dalai Lama. The Chronology The best way to tell the story of Zacharias of the New Testament is first to do so according to the calendar. It is next to impossible to understand the story of Zacharias without telling the story via a timeline, including the characters surrounding him. Around 20 B.C., Zacharias was a high priest in the temple. This is 14 years before the birth of his son was announced when he continued to be high priest in the temple. This was also the year when Joachim and Anna were told by an angel of the pending birth of the Virgin Mary. Herod the Great had to know Zacharias personally because Zacharias prominently officiated in the temple of Herod for a long time. Herod began the renovation of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem in 20 B.C. This construction project lasted until 64 A.D. 
and only enjoyed six years of peace from the end of its renovation to its destruction in 70 A.D. The temple was greatly expanded under the reign of King Herod to include a praetorium in the corner of the courtyard for the Romans, which was used by Pilate, and numerous rooms used by the high priests of the Sanhedrin. Two of the most prominent priests were Annas and Caiaphas, who owned the money changers' tables. They most certainly had a place to administer the gathering of the tithes and offerings. This business was called the Bazaar of Annas and had begun around the time of the beginning of the renovation of the temple and the birth of the Virgin Mary. This configuration was designed by Herod to appease the Romans and allow the dynasty of Annas, the former chief high priest, to gather money from tithes and offerings from those who attended the temple. Annas, in turn, would share the wealth with Herod. The custom was to pay one's tithes and offerings at least once a year to the priests of the temple, probably coinciding with the harvest, the sale of animals, or a tenth of the profit from merchant traffic. Herod participated in that revenue stream as a partner with Annas and Caiaphas, though he didn't rule from a palace on the temple mound itself. We can only speculate that the upgrades for the temple were a revenue-generating construction project and not merely a gift on the part of Herod to the Jews. The revenue generated by the temple was enormous. The running of the temple was big business. Certainly Herod didn't pay for the temple renovation from Roman revenues or out of his own pocket. The opulent nature of the temple was evidence of the wealth generated by the tithes of Israel at the time of Jesus. The mysterious part of the history of the temple was that it was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Destroying the temple represented a dramatic change of heart on the part of the Romans after the death of Jesus. The Jews had been Roman allies and fought alongside factions of the Romans, both in their wars with other countries and in the Roman civil wars. It was Simon, the first Jewish Hasmonean dynasty king appointed by the Romans, who had made the original alliances with Rome long before Rome occupied Judea with Roman legions. The Jews solicited Roman occupation. The Romans allowed the Jews to police themselves, run their own jails and civic projects, and most importantly, to own and operate their own private temple for 300 years. Josephus, quoting Julius Caesar's successor Augustus, wrote, And that they not be obliged to go before any judge on the Sabbath day, nor on the day of preparation to it, after the ninth hour. Clearly, the observations of Julius Caesar had left a lasting legacy for his successor, Emperor Augustus who decreed that the Jews should receive the same privileges as Romans under Roman law. The inner sanctum of the temple wasn't accessible to Pilate and the Romans, though they occupied the tower in the corner of the courtyard. It was not likely that Herod had access either. The inner sanctum of the temple was protected by very large, locked doors that were almost never opened. The inner temple was reserved for believers and the faithful, though the grounds of the temple were accessible to all kinds of people, including Romans. They had to let people in to pay their tithes and offerings, whether they were faithful or not. There were two main reasons the temple was destroyed. The Romans ransacked the temple treasures for the building of the Colosseum in Rome, and the temple was invaded so that the emperors after Tiberius could place their image in the inner sanctum. Caesars and emperors had never been interested in placing their images in the temple before the events surrounding Jesus. But a God who could cause earthquakes and make the dead come back to life was a God to be feared. This must have made emperors like Caligula jealous. He was the first Caesar to claim he was a God like the Jewish God. The ones before him were content to be just emperor. One can only imagine what he was thinking when one of his territories had a sanctuary filled with miracles. Caligula had to put his image inside that sanctuary, which fomented the wars between the Jews and the Romans. 
Violating the sanctuary in the temple was enough to start a war. No wonder when Jesus threatened to destroy the very same temple three days before his crucifixion and then raise it again in three days, it made him a threat to the Jews as well. You could do many awful things to the Jews, but the one thing you couldn't do was defile their temple. The temple was the one thing that defined the Jews as a people. Besides, the leaders of Jerusalem used the temple to gather their revenue. To destroy the temple was tantamount to hitting them where it hurts, in the wallet, as well as destroying their connection with God. During this same year, Joachim, the father of the Virgin Mary, was insulted by the high priest Reuben at the Feast of Dedication for making offerings to God in thanksgiving for his family, though he didn't have any children at the time. The Proto-Evangelium, written by James, said that Joachim was very wealthy and had been making double the typical offering. Joachim said, My substance shall be for the benefit of the whole people, that I might find mercy with the Lord God for the forgiveness of my sins. This indicated that the father of the Virgin Mary was a very rich man, unlike our traditions of the Virgin Mary. Remember that Anna, the mother of the Virgin Mary and wife of Joachim, was likely the sister of Joseph of Arimathea, who was the very rich merchant from the Bible who asked Pilate for the body of Jesus and buried Jesus in his tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was another very wealthy man of the sea. Zacharias was a high priest in the temple and a member of the family of Joachim. Joachim would never have been condemned by Zacharias, whose name meant God has remembered. High priests like Reuben, Annas, and Caiaphas controlled the revenues of the temple. Annas and his successive five sons and his son-in-law Caiaphas were all successively the chief high priest of the Sanhedrin. Joachim was told by Reuben that his offering could never be acceptable to God because his wife was cursed and that she didn't have children. See Psalm chapter 119 at verse 3. Annas used the size of his family as proof that he was more worthy than even the wealthy Joachim. It is little wonder Reuben would have made public disparaging remarks against money offerings made by Joachim. Reuben didn't refuse the offerings from Joachim. He just belittled them. Annas was aware of prophecies about the coming of the Virgin Mary because he offered one of his sons to be betrothed to the Virgin Mary. After the sons of Annas were rejected as suitable husbands, James said it was Annas who made accusations against Joseph and Mary to the Sanhedrin when Mary was found expecting Jesus before she was wed to Joseph. The resulting trial of Mary and Joseph was left out of the Bible, but it was an event spoken of for centuries after the birth of Christ. Of course, Mary and Joseph were proven to be acceptable to the Lord, which surely humiliated Annas and initiated a feud between the two families, which ultimately led to the crucifixion of Jesus. Ashamed of being reproached by Reuben, Joachim went to be with his shepherds in the pastures where he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He said, I will not go down either to eat or drink till the Lord my God shall look down upon me, but my prayer shall be my meat and drink. In the end, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joachim and told him that his prayers had been heard by God and that he was to have a daughter. The angel also told Joachim that his daughter's name was to be Mary. Around 19 B.C., James records the following about Joachim after Joachim received the message from the angel. And Joachim went down and called his shepherds, saying, Bring me here ten she-lambs without spot or blemish, and they will be for the Lord my God. And bring me twelve calves without blemish, and the twelve calves will be for the priests and the elders. Bring me also a hundred goats, and the hundred goats will be for the whole people. And Joachim went down with the shepherds, and Anna stood by the gate and saw Joachim coming with the shepherds. And she ran, and hanging about his neck said, Now I know that the Lord has greatly blessed me, for behold, 
I was a widow and am no longer a widow, and I who was barren shall conceive. And Joachim abode the first day in his house, but on the next he brought his offerings and said, If the Lord be propitious to me, let the plate which is on the priest's forehead make it manifest. Now, the plate on the priest's forehead was an instrument appointed for the high priest to wear in the event of such discoveries. The answers to prayers were made manifest on the plate on the forehead of the priest. This plate is mentioned in Exodus chapter 28 at verse 36. Later, John the Beloved wrote of the Mark 666 of Satan that is to be placed in the forehead of all men at the end of days. This was in reference to the plate that was worn on the forehead by the original high priests. Continuing on, And he consulted the plate which the priest wore and saw it, and behold, sin was not found in him. And Joachim said, Now I know that the Lord is propitious to me and has taken away all my sins. He went down from the temple of the Lord justified, and he went to his own house. This was the year of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. The church celebrates this feast on December the 8th. James quotes Anna as saying, That it may now be told the sons of Reuben that Anna gives her child the breast. Around 18 B.C. This was the traditional year of the birth of the Virgin Mary. Catholicism celebrates her birth on September the 8th, precisely nine months after the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, though it is likely that Mary was born a couple of years earlier. They probably had the date and the time of year wrong. Jesus was born in the spring when the lambs were in the fields being tended by the shepherds at night. If it had been winter, the sheep wouldn't have been grazing in the fields, but would, would have been housed in barns or shelters where they could be fed. Mary was 14 or 15 when she was betrothed to Joseph, and that had to be before the death of Herod in 4 B.C., which is well documented. And when nine months were fulfilled to Anna, she brought forth and said to the midwife, What have I brought forth? And she told her, A girl. Then Anna said, The Lord has this day magnified my soul, and she laid in her bed. And when the days of her purification were accomplished, she nursed the child and called her name Mary. The Virgin Mary spent her youth from the time she was three years old till the time she was betrothed on the Temple Mound. Mary was attended by Zacharias, who often found that Mary had been fed by the angels. Obviously, Zacharias was there at the Temple for more than just a week. Around 12 B.C., Sulpicius Quirinius, a Roman senator, became governor of Crete and Cyrene. He was the governor of Syria at the time of the census, which was being taken when Jesus was born. However, that census and the gathering of the taxes could have lasted for a very long time. From the year 10 to 7 B.C., and when she was 12 years of age, the priest met in a council and said, Behold, Mary is twelve years of age. What will we do with her for fear that the holy place of the Lord our God should be defiled? This coincides with the onset of puberty. Then replied the priest to Zacharias the high priest, You stand at the altar of the Lord and enter into the holy place to make petitions concerning her. So whatsoever the Lord will show to you, do it. Then the high priest entered into the holy of holies, and taking away with him the breastplate of judgment, made prayers concerning her. Now, regarding this breastplate of judgment, we find in Exodus the following, And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in to the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Exodus 28 at verse 29. The Significance of the Breastplate of Judgment The breastplate of judgment was of great importance because they also used it to get directions from God. The directions as how it was to be made were given to Moses. The King James Version of the Bible translated the Hebrew word chosen as breastplate. 
The Greek Septuagint version of the Old Testament used the word logion for the breastplate and means a speaking place. This describes exactly what the breastplate really was, the oracle, or means by which God spoke to the high priest. What did this breastplate look like? The breastplate was designed with the idea that the names of the twelve tribes engraved on the stones should be worn near Aaron's heart when he went into the Holy of Holies. One of the descriptions of the breastplate suggested it was made of metal. However, in reality, and according to the Bible, the breastplate of judgment was like the inner curtains of the tabernacle, of cunning work, which means that it was a work from a skilled weaver. The material consisted of threads of gold woven together with blue, purple, and scarlet linen. The number of the threads and the order of the colors were, according to the Targums, or renderings of the Old Testament script, as follows. One was the color of gold, six of blue, six of purple, and six of scarlet. The Urim and Thummim. The breastplate was actually made of two pieces, which formed sort of a purse or bag, in which also housed the two sacred stones, named the Urim, representing light and excellence, and the Thummim, representing perfection and completion. These stones were divinely appointed instruments by which the high priest inquired of God about matters concerning the welfare of the children of Israel. The Bible makes several references to these miraculous stones. These stones were probably two jewels. When someone had to make an important decision, the request was made known to the high priest. In turn, he would stand before the lampstand near the altar holding the Urim in one hand and the Thummim in the other. As the light from the candle reflected upon the Urim and the Thummim onto the stones of the breastplate, they flashed with light which provided up to 24 color and light combinations, 12 from each stone. Since there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, the flashes of light may have produced strings of letters. It was said that God breathed through the wind, which in turn caused the veil to move as with inhaling and exhaling of air. This caused a breeze to flicker the flames in the lampstand, which varied the angle of direction of the light onto the Urim and Thummim, and then to the breastplate. God was able to communicate directly to the high priest and answer the inquiry using these stones. Which stones were on the breastplate? Upon the breastplate were set four rows of precious stones, three in each row, and upon them were engraved the names of the twelve tribes. Josephus adds that the stones were placed in the order of their birth, or the birth of the twelve sons of Jacob, or Israel. The following is from the Bible. And thou shalt set in its settings of stone, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings, and the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel. The Dress of the High Priest The awesome responsibility of the high priest required a sanctified person dressed in holy garments. The uppermost holy garment is apron-like and is called the ephod. On top of the ephod was the square breastplate with the twelve precious stones. On each shoulder piece of the ephod was also a precious stone. Six names were written on each of the two stones, altogether naming the twelve tribes of Israel. Every time the high priest went before God at the golden incense altar, the names of all the people of God were upon his shoulders. The blue garment is called the robe, under which the high priest wore a white fine linen woven tunic. On his head is the white fine linen turban. Around the base of the turban is the crown of gold with the inscription, Holy to the Lord. This dress was passed to his successor at his death. The dress of the priest is interesting and not unlike that worn by clergy today. 
The apron is like the one used by the Masonic order. The apron represents the covering of fig leaves Adam and Eve used to cover themselves. It is amazing to understand that the familiar temple clothing is found among the Masonic order, the successors of the Templars. The Knights Templar Curiously, the original name of the Knights Templar had been the Order of John the Baptist. They changed their name after their discovery in the Temple Mound. As we have discussed before, that discovery was likely the Temple Protocol itself. We now know why the Templars changed their name to reflect the Temple, but it is still vague as to why their original name was the Order of John the Baptist, rather than Christians or the Fraternity of Jesus. Did their name have something to do with Zacharias? The name Arian is derived from the name Aaron. The Aryan nations, of which the Templars considered themselves to belong, thought of themselves as the legacy of the twelve tribes of Israel, in the same fashion as the Jews thought themselves to be the surviving heirs. The Celts, or Templars, immortalized the name of Hiram Abiff down to our present day. Hiram was the builder of the Temple of Solomon. His mother was from the tribe of Naphtali. His baptismal font, built hundreds of years before Jesus, sat on the back of twelve oxen and was called the Brass Sea. It is no coincidence that John was known to be the great baptizer. In Luke chapter 1 at verse 69, the house of David would be reestablished in a horn of plenty, which was thought by the earliest Templars to be the tribe of Levi. The horn was referring to the horns of the oxen on the sea of brass, which represents the twelve tribes of Israel. Ephraim, the birthright son of Joseph, is mentioned too, but as a bull who loves to thresh. Ephraim is like a frisky heifer when he goes out to gore the nations. Ephraim would go to the ends of the earth, like the Americas. Alexander the Great conquered the whole earth, with the exception of the lands of the Celts in Western Europe, and the Celts took that to be evidence that they were the chosen of the Lord and the horn of salvation. In Luke chapter 1 at verse 74, the horn of salvation was to rescue us from the hands of our enemies. In verse 76 it reads, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins, which is exactly what baptism represents itself to be. In verse 67, Zacharias spoke of his son fulfilling the words of the holy prophets of old, particularly the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi, the one who is appointed to prepare the way for the Lord, just like John, came in the spirit and power of Elijah. At least, this is what the Templars were thinking in their day. In the book of Hebrews, we learn that the great men of God considered themselves aliens and strangers and looked for a country of their own. There is one of the tribe to whom God never gave an inheritance, the Levites. These were the ones that God settled among all the tribes, but never allotted them their own territory in the Holy Land. They owned property and built houses, but it was in the territory of the other tribes. Only they were appointed to be permanent priests to serve God in his dwelling place, the Holy Temple. Their service to him was their whole life, just as Moses had stated. God planned for the Levites to be the one tribe that was truly intertribal. The purpose of the Levites was to be the teachers of the law and judgments from the Danube all the way to India. Alexander the Great had conquered everything before him, and so the Greek culture spread throughout the Middle East. His general Ptolemy became Pharaoh of Egypt. The territories of Alexander's conquest are surprisingly similar to the Islamic Ottoman Empire that arose much later. Getting back to the Templars, the Celts were known as the Order of John, and later, select groups of them were also called the Knights Templar. But Knights Templar is merely a shortened version of the complete title. The full title 
is the order of the poor soldiers of Christ in the Temple of Solomon. Since the Celtic warrior knights were established in Europe five centuries before Christ, they knew of and remembered only the Temple of Solomon. They were not involved in Zerubbabel's effort to restore the temple after the Jews were released from Babylon, nor were they directly involved in Herod's temple, although they certainly knew of it. The Knights Templar were famous for their buildings, in which they incorporated glorious artifacts and intricate workmanship. They were aware of the instructions of Almighty God concerning intricate and masterly workmanship and the design of everything that he had required to be made. In calling themselves the poor soldiers of Christ, they, like Christ, were stonemasons and carpenters. They also had visions of building and completing the greatest project of all time, the temple described in the book of Ezekiel, and with it all the glory of the temple of Solomon. The name Templar reflects this desire to build that temple. For this reason, at the start of the 6th millennium, about 1000 A.D., they mounted crusades to drive out the infidels, the Moslems, from the Holy Land. They used their power, prestige, and great wealth to wage these wars and to galvanize all their allies into action. They had hoped that their efforts would see the establishment of the kingdom and that their millennium would indeed be the 1,000 years of peace spoken of in prophecy. Their expectations were not met because they were driven by desire in spite of reality. But it was a noble desire nonetheless. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. Psalm 115. Zacharias was the high priest in charge of selecting a mate for the Virgin Mary. From the book written by James, we have the following account. And behold, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, Zacharias, Zacharias, go forth and call together all the widowers among the people, and let every one of them bring his rod, and he by whom the Lord will show a sign will be the husband of Mary. And the criers went out through all Judea, and all the people ran and met together when the trumpet of the Lord sounded. Joseph also, throwing away the hatchet, went out to meet them, and when they were met, they went to the high priest, taking every man his rod. After the high priest had received their rods, he went into the temple to pray. And when he had finished his prayer, he took the rods and went forth and distributed them, and no miracle attended them. The last rod was taken by Joseph, and behold, a dove proceeded out of the rod and flew upon the head of Joseph. And the high priest said, Joseph, you are the person chosen to take the virgin of the Lord, to keep her for him. But Joseph refused, saying, I am an old man and have children, but she is young, and I fear that I should appear ridiculous in Israel. Now Joseph was older and a widower with children before his marriage with the virgin. Theflac, Ocumenius, all the Latin fathers till Ambrose, and later Greek fathers maintained these opinions of Joseph's age and family. Then the high priest replied, Joseph, fear the Lord your God, and remember how God dealt with Dathan, Korah, and Eberam, how the earth opened and swallowed them up because of their contradiction. You can find the story of Dathan, Korah, and Eberam in Numbers chapter 16. The years 7 through 5 B.C., the archangel Gabriel. Gabriel was the angel who announced to the Virgin Mary that she was with child. The archangel Gabriel appeared to Mary, greeting her with the words, Hail Mary, full of grace, you have found favor with God. James said that it was Gabriel who had the occasion to feed the Virgin Mary in the temple. 
Gabriel told her that she will bear a son, and his name was to be Jesus. He was also the angel who visited Zacharias to announce that he would also be a father. The angelic names are often other names for people who once lived on the earth or who have not yet been born. For example, Jesus was often associated with the angelic name Ambrose, not to be confused with the mortal Ambrose. There are some who think that Gabriel was in fact the prophet Noah. The Annunciation and Visitation Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, who wrote down at his son's presentation at the temple, His name is John. See Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 80. Zacharias was mute because he doubted what Gabriel had told him. Joseph, after considering divorcing his betrothed Mary, was visited by Gabriel, who told him Mary is pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit and not to fear marrying her. John the Baptist was born in the fall, and Jesus was born the next spring. Many have confused the birth of John the Baptist in October with the birth of Jesus, when Jesus was clearly born in the spring. They were often confused one with the other. Anna, the mother of the Virgin Mary, also had the blood of the Greeks in her veins because she was born in Brittany, where the descendants of King Brutus had lived in exile from the time of the Trojan Wars and where Gathalus had migrated after the Exodus. It would only be right that the two royal families would have intermarried. Therefore, Jesus was the rightful heir to the birthright of the tribe of Joseph as well. Because of this link with Skoda, the granddaughter of Joseph, son of Israel. The Greek Gathalus married Skoda at the time of Moses. Gathalus and Skoda fled Egypt on ships around the time of the Exodus, and two countries are named after them, Portugal and Scotland. Anna, the mother of the Virgin Mary, was also a Jewess. She came from the line of the daughter of King Zedekiah, who, along with Jeremiah the prophet, had escaped to Brittany at the time of the Babylonian conquest. Zedekiah had no remaining sons, and his birthright to the throne of David came through his daughter. This is the only way Jesus could have been heir to the throne of David. It was the only way anyone could have been heir to the throne of David. Simon, the first Jewish king of the Hasmonean dynasty, clearly was not the heir to the throne of David. He said himself he would reign until a suitable prophet be found to reign in his stead. The year 6 to 4 B.C. The Magi brought their gifts to the Christ child in the stable where he was born. The holy innocents, all male babies aged two years and under, were slaughtered by the order of King Herod the Great. See Matthew chapter 2. Herod the Great died in 4 B.C. He was succeeded by his son, Herod Archelaus. Zacharias was murdered in the temple for not revealing the whereabouts of his wife and son. They had fled into the wilderness. A great number of Levite priests were also put to death at this time. The aged Simeon was named high priest, succeeding Zacharias. From the Proto-Evangelium we learned, And there was no secret places to be found. Then she groaned within herself and said, O mountain of the Lord, receive the mother with the child. For Elizabeth could not climb up. And instantly the mountain was divided and received them. The escape of Elizabeth into a miraculous opening in a mountain has been an appealing theme to non-caniacal writers. The story is found in the Acts of Paul and Thessia. The baby, John the Baptist, was under suspicion as the promised king of Israel because he was born shortly before Jesus. We read, And there appeared to them an angel of the Lord to preserve them. But Herod made search after John, and sent servants to Zacharias when he was ministering at the altar, and said to him, Where have you hidden your son? He replied to them, I am a minister of God and a servant at the altar. How should I know where my son is? So the servants went back and told Herod the whole story, at which he was incensed and said, 
Is not this son of his likely to be king in Israel? He sent therefore again his servants to Zacharias, saying, Tell us the truth, where is your son? For you know that your life is in my hand. So the servants went and told him all this. But Zacharias replied to them, I am a martyr for God, and if he shed my blood, the Lord will receive my soul. Besides, know you that you shed innocent blood. However, Zacharias was murdered in the entrance of the temple and altar and about the partition. But the children of Israel knew not when he was killed. Then at the hour of salutation for the priests, they went into the temple. But Zacharias did not, according to custom, meet them and bless them. Yet they still continued waiting for him to salute them. And when they found he did not come for a long time, one of them ventured into the holy place where the altar was, and he saw blood lying upon the ground congealed. When, behold, a voice from heaven said, Zacharias is murdered, and his blood will not be wiped away until the revenger of his blood come. But when he heard this, he was afraid, and he went forth and told the priest what he had seen and heard, and they all went in and saw the fact. The roofs of the temple then howled and were rent from the top to the bottom, and they could not find the body, but only blood made hard like stone. The murder of Zacharias was referred to by Jesus when he said, that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. See Matthew chapter 23 and Luke chapter 11. The story of the murder of Zacharias is told in James's Proto-Evangelum and in both the Jerusalem and Babylonish Talmud, cited by Lightfoot. Rabbi Jaconan said, 80,000 priests were slain for the blood of Zacharias. Rabbi Judas asked Rabbi Achan where Zacharias has been killed. He said Zacharias had been killed in the court of the priests, which was in the temple. He said that some of the blood of Zacharias was taken by Elizabeth to the tops of the mountains where it could not be hidden or washed away in fulfillment of prophecy. See Ezekiel chapter 24. Rabbi Judas said, They committed seven evils that day. They murdered a priest, a prophet, and a king. They shed the blood of the innocent. They polluted the court. They did it on the Sabbath and the day of expitiation. He went on to quote that, When Nebuzaradan came, meaning the captain of the guard next to the king, he saw Zacharias' blood bubbling, and he said to them, What does this mean? They answered, It is the blood of calves, lambs, and rams, which we have offered upon the altar. He commanded them that they should bring calves, lambs, and rams, and said, I will test whether this is their blood. Accordingly, they brought and slew the animals, but the blood of Zacharias still bubbled, but the blood of the animals did not. Then he said, Declare to me the truth of the matter, or else I will comb your flesh with iron combs. Then they said to him, Zacharias was a priest, prophet, and judge, who prophesied to Israel all these calamities which we have suffered from you. But we arose against him and slew him. Then he said, I will appease him. Then he took the rabbis and slew them upon Zacharias' blood, and he was not yet appeased. Next he took the young boys from the schools and slew them upon his blood, and yet the blood of Zacharias still bubbled. Then he brought the young priests and slew them in the same place, and yet it still bubbled. So he slew at length 94,000 persons upon the spot where the blood spilt, and it did not stop bubbling. Then he drew near to it and said, O Zacharias, Zacharias, you have occasioned the death of the chief of your countrymen. Shall I slay them all? Then the blood ceased and did bubble no more. And they went away and told the people that Zacharias was murdered. All the tribes of Israel heard and mourned for him and lamented three days. Then the priests took counsel together concerning a person to succeed Zacharias. 
And Simeon and the other priests cast lots, and the lot fell upon Simeon. For he had been assured by the Holy Spirit that he should not die until he had seen Christ come in the flesh. This must be the Simeon whose story is in Luke chapter 2 at verse 26. James, who wrote the Proto-Evangelium, was later made the first bishop of Jerusalem. St. John Chrysostom, the archbishop of Constantinople, spoke of James in his Holy Five on Matthew. This must be the Simeon whose story is in Luke chapter 2. James, who wrote the Proto-Evangelium, was later made the first bishop at Jerusalem. St. John Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople, spoke of James in his homily five on Matthew. James is the one who recorded this story for us. He was so admired that he became the first bishop of Jerusalem. And they say he gave himself up to such great austerity that even his members said that he would fall to the ground like he was dead from his continual praying. His forehead became so callous as to be in no better state than a camel's knees. According to tradition, James was executed at the prompting of the Sanhedrin, being thrown from the temple walls, then clubbed to death about 62 A.D. Postulus said that the Proto-Evangelium of James was publicly read as canonical in the Eastern churches, they having no doubt that James was the author of it. The allusions to it in writings of the early church fathers are frequent, and their expressions indicate that it was well accepted in the Christian world. The Two Annunciations, the Apparition to Zacharias St. Luke indicates the date of the apparition to Zacharias by placing it toward the end of the reign of Herod the Great. The true scepter had departed from Judah during the Hasmonean dynasty, the Herod in question was the son of an Emudian. The Herod in question was the son of an Edumian, of the wealthy and influential Antipater or Antipas. Antipater actively cultivated the friendship of the Romans. Through the influence of his father, the ambitious Herod obtained first the government of Galilee and finally that of Judea. History represents Herod as a cruel monster. His life was a series of murders of which the victims were not only the holy innocents, but also his own wives and children. Upon the death of Herod, the emperor Augustus divided Palestine among Herod's sons. Archelaus, the eldest son who succeeded his father and received the provinces of Judah, Samaria, and Edumia. Herod II, Antipas, obtained Galilee. Augustus gave Philip II the north of the country to the east of the Jordan. It was Herod II who later beheaded John the Baptist. Archelaus ruled with the same cruelty as his father and was exiled to Vienna in Gaul in 6 AD. His territory was incorporated into the Roman province of Syria and administered by special Roman governors, one of which was Pontius Pilate. Shortly afterward, the province of Herod II Antipas, and also that of Philip II, and the territory once governed by Archelaus were, by imperial favor, granted to a nephew of Herod the Great, who ruled as king of all Palestine from 41 to 44 A.D. About the year 41, he beheaded the apostle James the Great and caused Peter to be apprehended. Upon the sudden death of Herod Agrippa I, Palestine was joined to Syria and again administered by Roman governors. However, the son of Agrippa I, or Herod Agrippa II, retained the land of his father, including custody of the temple. Paul was taken before this King Agrippa, who was almost converted. Prominent among the governors of this period were Felix, before whom Paul appeared in bonds at Caesarea, and Festus, who sent St. Paul to Rome to be judged. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by Vespasian and Titus in the year 70 A.D. In the end, Jesus and John were both born around the same time and died around the same time. 
That was part of the confusion between the two. In addition, while Jesus was traveling the world with his rich relatives, John stayed near Jerusalem his whole life. No wonder the Templars knew the story of their illustrious ancestor from the tribe of Aaron better than that of Jesus. Each of the tribe had its own reasons for owning a piece of the saga of Jesus, though the birthright had clearly descended through Jacob's son, Joseph. Nothing he or his heirs could ever do would remove the birthright from the line of Joseph or change the promise that Abraham made to Sarah that through her son would come powerful kings and rulers of the world. However, that is a story for another class. Thank you for listening.